So real quickly, I wanna introduce you to Greg and Lynn McDonald who attend one of our churches. This is their story, and they were so gracious to share their story with us on video. Now, this is emotional. Uh, you, in fact, if you so far have disagreed with everything I've said, you're gonna feel like this is cheating, and there you go, Andy, you're not giving a scripture. Last night you gave us a lot of scripture. Now you're gonna tell us a bunch of stories. Okay, I, I understand that. We're, I'm gonna get to that in just a minute. But this is the reality for those of us who are in ministry. Again, if we're all just public speakers running around or you could just bloggers and you know, it would be easy. But we're dealing with real people and real relationships and, and real people that we love. So we have to figure this out. It is not political for me. It is not political for you, is it? It is relational because we're in ministry and because we've learned to distinguish between theology and ministry, we can figure this out. So here's their story and then I'll pick up our story right after you watch this. Take a look. This is Greg and Lynn. We're Greg and Lynn McDonald and uh, we're from, actually from Michigan. We were high school sweethearts, got married right out of uh, high school. Lynn was 18, I was 20. And that's a long time ago, that's 37 years ago. I got pregnant and we had our daughter. And then a couple years later after that, we had our son. And so I always dreamed of having a, a family. I wanted, I wanted a boy, a girl, the white picket fence, the dog. I wanted the whole kit and caboodle. I uh, met with a, a good friend of mine who's a pastor every Friday for lunch, kind of an accountability relationship. And he had told me uh, he was brokenhearted. He had just found out that his son was accessing uh, uh, pornography on the family computer. And I remember going home and thinking, boy, I, I gotta check out our computer. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, our son was accessing porn on the computer as well, except it was gay porn. We had dinner with our son and I had shared with him what I had uncovered. His immediate response was, I've always dreaded this day. He was, you know, crushed with, I don't know if it was embarrassment. It was very difficult for him. It was difficult for us. And every day you'd wake up and that's if you could sleep. And when you woke up, you felt like you're living this horrible dream. And then all of a sudden the society I lived in took on a whole different look. Now I heard all these gay jokes being told at lunch, you know, and I, I, I saw TV differently, you know, and um, it was just, it was very um, almost surreal to, to, to go through those days. There were a lot of questions that, that came to mind, questioning myself as a mother, mm -hmm. questioning my husband as a father. Are we gonna lose our friends? Are we gonna, be able to attend the same church that we've been attending. I was frightened. I was frightened that if I was gonna, if I chose to love my, my son, does that mean that I'm gonna have to abandon God because of just how I was raised very conservatively and how verses of the Bible were, were taught to me. I was more concerned about myself than I was even my child. Early on, our direction to Greg and our first conversation was, though we'll never stop loving you, like we need to get you fixed. So starting with ourself, the messages that we were enforcing were pretty negative for the relationship. So when Greg went off to school, um, it actually uh, uh, took the tension way down. We continued to stay really close to Greg, even when he was in New York or Chicago. You know, we'd, we'd uh, we travel frequently to go see him. Um, made it a point to uh, not only hang out with him, but with his friends. I actually think it was those times where the relationship really started to uh, take hold again. You know, we, we, we became friends with literally dozens of gay folks around. Now they're around the country because they've grown up and they've got jobs and they're all over the place. But uh, I would routinely ask a lot of the same questions, you know, it's so like, uh, when did you decide to be gay? <laughs> um, and I, I've never had anybody explain, oh, well, that was on such and such a date. They, they all say, mm -hmm. are you crazy? Like, who would ever pick this lifestyle? And asking them, you know, what, what are the greatest hurts? And always, always, it's either family members, you know, a mom saying, get out of my house, I never want to see you again. Um, or in most cases, it's the church, which is a huge ache for us, you know, because we're concerned about their souls, and here they've been, you know, pushed away. We, I think we reached a point with our relationship with Greg where we felt comfortable enough and confident enough where I was totally fine strapping a bullseye on my chest and saying, have at it. 
And so I think that was a turning point for me. That was a turning point that, okay, it's not the life that I wanted and, you know, when I first got married, but that God was in it and that God was orchestrating this and it was going to be okay. You know, today we're not, we're not interested in trying to change people. We're just interested in trying to love them. And uh, early on, that wasn't necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. I'd say today we're, we're really attempting to be focused on, on loving the people God puts in our path. So whether it's, you know, um, a gay man in Chicago who's uh, being prepped for back surgery, he'd been kicked out of his house, uh, and he calls us and says, um, would you pray with me? If you don't have a relationship, you don't have to worry about having those, those opportunities. If you have a relationship, then you have these incredible opportunities to speak truth into people's life. It's a lot freer for us. And again, as life happens, we find that we become sure footing for somebody who's in the midst of a trial.